Good evening. Good evening. Hi, I'm Ingrid P. Lewis Martin, Senior Advisor to Brooklyn Borough President Eric O. Adams. I'd like to welcome you to April 1st. Today's the first, right? May 1st, 2018, Brooklyn Borough Board meeting. To my right is my colleague, Richard Burrick, who most of you probably know. He's our land use director. I call him the land use guru. Well, he's I'm missing in action, here. but he's coming. <laughs> is deputy to the senior advisor to the borough president, David Johnson. So I want to welcome all of you. We'll start, I believe we're one shy of quorum. I think we need 18, including the vote of the borough president, in order for us to vote on the item. So we'll just move forward. And once we achieve quorum, then we'll go back to do our vote for the, um, the minutes. So we have two presentations tonight. The first, oh, thank you. I thought it, had on, I thought it was on both sides. Ah, yay! That's 18. So let's clap. <laughs> CB1, Dialis Fuller. So we'll wait till Dialis joins us and then we will move along accordingly. So while we're waiting for Dialis, um, I would like to adopt the most uh, minutes from the April 3rd, 2018 Borough Board meeting, as well as the minutes from the March 6th, 2018 Brooklyn Borough Board meeting, because we didn't have quorum last month. So if there's no objections, I will ask someone, please make a motion. So no, you gotta say your name in the mic. Please. Man Wai Lao, Community Board 11. Move that we adopt the uh, minutes of the uh, March as well as the April meeting. Thank you very much. Would somebody please second? second. You got to say it in the mic. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, second that motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Any abstentions? Okay, so the motion carried. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> Tonight's first agenda item is a presentation by the Prospect Park Alliance on the carousel renovation and a vote on the design approval. Representatives of the Prospect Park Alliance are here tonight and will be available to take questions from the borough board. It says Corey Provost, but Corey isn't here. Um, he might be here by time. Okay, but what is your name? So Sheena Enriquez, we know Sheena, we just forgot your name. But Sheena Enriquez is here, so she will start the presentation and maybe even carry it through. All right, please, come on. You're welcome. Hi, all. Um, I'm Sheena Enriquez. I am the assistant architect of the Office of Design and Construction at the Prospect Park Alliance. I'm really excited to give you some updates. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, on the uh, carousel restoration that we will embarking on soon. Um, I'm sorry, is this the... Okay. So here's an image of the uh, Prospect Park carousel. Um, I just want to point out during this presentation, we, uh, I'll be referring to the carousel building and the carousel mechanics or the merry-go-round um, so if you look at this, everything in brick is the carousel building, and on the inside with the lights and what carries the horses, that's the merry-go-round or the mechanics, and both need restoration, just so we're on the same page there. I don't know if you can read this, but I'm going to go through this uh, slide by slide, but this is an overall list of what we plan to uh, fix here. Um, so I just want to mention that the... Uh, Total funding for this project is $500,000, and it's provided by Council Member Lori Cumbo. Yes. That's my council member. <laughs> I love her. So we're, we're, our goal is to just to restore one of the most popular attractions here at Prospect Park, oh, over at Prospect Park. Uh, at this site, there's some work. We'll go through these items. This is hard to read, but the following slides will be much more clear to you. Uh, we're going to be restoring the carousel mechanics, and at the building there's a bunch of uh, repairs to do as well. But I'll go through it with you. So here's a map of the park, and north is that way. So you see, I'm just gonna point here, this is Flatbush Avenue, this is Ocean Avenue, and this is the Children's Corner, um, and that's where the carousel is located. Well, here's a close-up of that Children's Corner. So I don't know if some of you can remember when I presented Sorry, 
When I presented, if I could take this out, I feel like a stand-up comedian now. Uh, so when I presented Leopard's House uh, a while back, that, that is here. Uh, we're restoring that building, the old uh, Dutch colonial farmhouse. That's a very popular attraction at the park. I hope you all remember that. Um, and then across the way is the Prospect Par Park Carousel. And there's also an entrance to the Prospect Park Zoo. So you can enter the, the park at the Willink entrance and hit those three things, when I, which I know a lot of families do. So now that you know where we are, let's see where we've been. I love this image. So this is uh, the building under construction on the left um, in 1952. So originally the carousel was built in 1912. The carousel itself, the mechanics, the horses, by a well-known carousel carver. Um, his last name was Carmel. Uh, and so it was installed in Coney Island for a long time until it was brought over to Prospect Park. This structure was built. And if anyone is familiar with the carousel at Central Park, it's the exact same building <laughs> to the T. Uh, so that's where it was in 1952. I don't know why these children were allowed on this um, construction site at the time, but what I just thought it was. Children? What's that? What were his children? Oh. <laughs> and so the beginning of the Alliance is also the, the, the first project at Prospect Park Alliance was to restore the carousel. So this is an image of the horses getting taken down and sent to, I believe it was Ohio, uh, to get restored. All the paint was stripped and th these horses were repainted. I also want to mention so that the, the carousel was closed down for a few years uh, and then it was reopened in 1990. So this is where we're at today. Um, the carousel, everything you see here was restored in, in the late 80s. Uh, even the Wurlitzer organ, it's an original like band organ um, with, I don't know what you call it, but it's like a scroll that plays music. And uh, Margaret, our concessionaire, still finds new music, like on eBay or wherever, to play on this, um, on, the, on the Wurlitzer. So this is what we're working with now. At this site, there's a blue stone around the building and it's cracked, so our crew has patched it with asphalt, but it really just needs to be replaced. I mentioned that the carousel mechanics or the merry-go-round, uh, it was restored 30 years ago. Uh, it's been used every year a lot, so it needs to be restored again. And also on the right, you could see all the guts of the uh, the mechanics, and so the electrical panel is the original from 1952. It's been in use since. Oh, here's a close-up of that. It's very old. And at the building itself, we have some issues with water damage, as we all know happens from time to time. So you see the gutters are leaking, the brick, when water gets on it and freezes and thaws, it cracks the brick. Uh, we see, it's hard to see here, but there's some biological growth of the concrete down here. And also hard to see is the gutters are overflowing. That has been addressed since this photo was taken. Uh, another thing we discovered is the wood columns are damaged at the base. So this image is of, imagine cutting through the building. So we have, um, what holds it up on the inside is this big timber frame. So you could kind of see that here. Um, and where that frame meets the ground, you could see here, uh, water had gotten in there at some point. And, and uh, we brought in a structural engineer to take a look, and we need to repair that. It's safe, it's sturdy, but it needs to be repaired. Other problems caused by that move. So when this, this structure moves, it deteriorates, it moves. The brick also moves. Brick's not made to move that much, so you see this brick separation as well, as well, and so um, that's something we're addressing as part of, the, of this restoration. Just another image of the same thing here. The, this is that big timber frame, and then the brick wall is separating from that. Another thing that we are working with is all the staff have to work with is just a water hose bib, like this type you see on the outside of a building or a house to water your garden. 
Um, but they're there all day, so they, they need a sink to wash their hands and, and stuff like that. So that's what this is an image of. So you probably guessed we're going to talk about what we're going to fix. Uh, so what is in red, we're looking bird's eye view down onto the building and, and the site around it. And what's in red are the, the pieces of bluestone that you saw earlier. These, these all have to be replaced because they're all cracked and we don't want people to trip. Sorry. This is an image I found online of a carousel that I wanted to draw it for you, but I not that good. So this is an image of uh, a similar carousel structure. So you know there's a center, the center pole, and everything is connected to it, and the center pole turns, and that's what turns everything else. And also when that turns, the horses go up and down. Uh, so this is all, I just want to mention that two-thirds of this work has already been done. Pr the Prospect Park Alliance has taken funds that we've raised on our own to, to restore what needs to be restored, and this, the funding coming from Lori Combo is, is going to go towards the remainder of this restoration of this, um, the mechanics itself. So right now, uh, there's a weight limit on people who can go on the horses that go up and down, because we don't want to stress the, uh, the mechanics too much. We're going to upgrade that electrical panel I showed earlier, and all the wiring. We're going to do a lot of uh, just work on the exterior. The, the gutters are really old. These, whatever brings the water down into the storm sewers are really old and clogged, so those are going to get replaced. The brick's going to get repaired. Wherever it's re leaking in the roof, that's going to get patched. Just very straightforward restoration work on the outside. And we are going to put in a sink so people can wash their hands. Pretty straightforward as well. And that is the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So do we have any questions? Please state your name and ask your question. <laughs> so Teresa, Scavo. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15. 500,000 is going to cover everything you just said? Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So that last item we're treating as an ad alternate. So that means that um, it might not be done. If The sink? Yes. We had to pick. It was a hard decision to make. We only have $500,000. We actually have other things we need to do with the building, like we want to redo the iron bars, but we just don't have enough to do everything. At That's this. my question. Yes. The 500 you do have is going to do the mechanical repairs yes. and the structural facade repairs and the roof repairs, the timber repairs? That is what we, so for each portion of work that we are proposing to do, we did a lot of research and reach out, reached out to contractors to see how much they think this would cost. So with our, based on that information, we believe that we can cover all this work, but we don't know, we won't know until the project goes out to bid and contractors actually bid on this project and say how much it'll cost for them to build it. And that's a year down the line from now. Once we're done with all the de design drawings and all the specifications, that's when we find that out. Um, but we've, we've been doing this, um, we've been doing this a lot, so this is, we make the most the best educated guess that we can cover this all, but we do have a list of priorities, so if something needs to be valued, engineered out, the staff said the sink can go, because we might be able to do it outside of this project as well. Just because it's not getting done here doesn't mean it's not going to get done, but as part of this capital, capital restoration work, this is what we thought is the top priority list of things to do. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do we have any other questions? No other questions? All right, so since we have no other questions, may I have a motion to please make sure I said it properly? Approve the design for the renovation of the Prospect Park Carousel House. You have to say your name in the mic. Jason Her, Majority Leader, Lori Cumble's office, moves to accept the plans. 
the re renovation renovations of the, of the Prospect Park. Of the Prospect Park. Carousel House. Carousel Houses. Thank you. Do I have a second, please? Second. In the mic, please. Teresa Scavo, CB 15 seconds that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I think I have to do a roll call, actually, right? Let mm -hmm. me just make sure. Come on, Dawn. Okay, could you please call the roll? Thank you. We'll start with community boards. Community board one? Yes. Community board two? Yes. Community board three? Community board four? Yes. Community board five? Yes. Community board six? Yes. Community board seven? Yes. Community board eight? Yes. Community board nine? Community Board 10? Yes. Community Board 11? Yes. Community Board 12? Community Board 13? Community Board 14? Yes. Community Board 15? Yes. Community Board 16? Yes. Community Board 17? Yes. Community Board 18? Okay. We'll go to Council Members now. Council Member Barron? Council Member Carnegie, Council Member Cumbo, yes. Council Member Council Member Deutsch, <coughs> Council Member Espinal, yes. Council Men Member Brennan, Council Member Eugene, yes. Council Member Yeager, Council Member Lander, yes. Council Member Levin, yes. Council Member Mizell, yes. Council Member Amprey Samuel? Yes. Council Member Menchaca? Yes. Council Member Reynoso? Council Member Traeger? Yes. Council Member Williams? Yes. Thank you, Borough President. Brooklyn Borough President? Yes. So, majority, actually, is not just the majority, it's, it's, it's the super, no, it's not a super majority, it's um, yeah. unanimous, that's the word I was looking for, unanimously it passes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, excellent. So now, we have a presentation um, by the Department of City Planning regarding a proposed zoning text amendment to limit the siding of hotels in the light manufacturing districts to those granted a special permit by City Planning. So Richard? We'll take over from here. Representatives of the Department of City Planning are here tonight to update us on their zoning text proposal further regulating hotels and light manufacturing zones. Representatives presented to the Borough Board in October in advance of their preparation of the environmental analysis and are now seeking recommendations from community boards and borough boards. City planning has now developed zoning text to advance this initiative intended to address the proliferation of hotels in M1 districts since 2010 as a means to ensure that sufficient opportunities would remain to support industrial and commercial growth. The text change proposal requiring the granting of a, proposes the granting of a special permit based on site specific review by the city planning commission for hotels to open in light manufacturing districts. This action is part of Mayor de Blasio's 10-point industrial action plan that targets these areas for employment, growth, and industrial innovation. During and after the presentation, the representatives will take questions from the borough board members. Given that the 60 days that this item has been referred to community boards and borough boards, and as a means of allowing community boards ample time to consider this matter, it has not been determined whether there would be an opportunity for the borough board to take an official position as that would likely requiring holding of a July meeting. Uh, we welcome Jackie Sun Wu to please come and state your name for the record and title for the record as well. Hi, my name is Jackie Sun Wu. I'm from the Department of City Planning. And I'm here to present a new zoning text amendment, which requires a special permit for new hotels in light manufacturing, or M1 districts. Um, we've seen a lot of new hotels open in these areas since 2010, and understand that they've generated some concerns amongst communities. 
We at the Department of City Planning are also concerned about balanced neighborhood growth, which is why we're taking action now. So you may remember first hearing about a hotel special permit in the context of a 10-point industrial action plan. Um, this included the creation of a special permit for new hotels and industrial business zones, or IBZs only. Um, IBZs include all M1, M2, and M3s, but only contain a small portion of the M1 districts. As we were studying the issue, we found that there was a broader set of concerns with hotels that affected all M1 districts, not just the IBZs. So this proposal here is looking at all of the M1 districts. I want to start with a bit of context. Um, as you're probably aware, New York City is growing in both population and jobs. Along with the city's overall growth, New York City's tourism industry has really boomed over the past years. Um, in 2017, we had 62.8 million visitors to the city, which is up from 42.6 million in 2015. This is almost a 40% jump in about 10 years. These robust visitor numbers led to strong demand for hotel rooms, and consequently, there has been increased hotel development in the past years. As of June of 2017, there are approximately 600 hotels with 116 hotel rooms in New York City, whereas seven years ago, there were only about 84,000 hotel rooms. And as of the same date, 24,000 more rooms were in the development pipeline. One thing to note is that the hotel market has really ext extended beyond Manhattan itself. For instance, in the last decade, the hotel room inventory tripled in Brooklyn and doubled in Queens. Brooklyn now has the third largest inventory amongst the five boroughs with 6,000 rooms. This is as of 2017. As far as hotels in light manufacturing districts, 30% of hotel rooms under construction citywide are in M1 zones whereas only 13% of the existing rooms are in M1 districts. In Brooklyn, almost 40% of the room inventory are in M1 zones. This really illustrates the growing number of hotel development in these areas. Um, the M1 districts where we've seen substantial hotel growth are widely mapped throughout the city. Today, these areas are very, uh, they vary a lot in character, ranging from the areas that still retain a lot of industrial activity to areas that are very mixed in character. Um, and with New York City's unprecedented growth in population and jobs, there's been increased competition for land and M1 zones have become one of the last areas of opportunity in the city. But the rules regulating land use and development in M1 districts have changed very little since 1961. And some rules that define the zoning framework needs to be revisited, one of them being the rules that allow for hotel development in these areas. Although unintended, the zoning and M1 districts work very well for hotels. As illustrated on this slide here, hotels can have a very tall building compared to the surrounding uses because they have the ability to use all of the floor area ratio or FAR. Um, they, the height and setback regulations also allow for tower development. Um, furthermore, because hotels don't necessarily need larger floor plates, they can build on smaller lots and work as infill development. Um, lastly, the parking and loading requirements are very generous for hotels, making these areas very attractive for hotel development. But hotels do result in potential conflict in an M1 districts. Um, these can be different in every site and every neighborhood, but they largely differ between the more, more actively industrial areas and the more mixed use areas. So in the more actively industrial areas, businesses generate noise, truck traffic, loading, and other nuisance that conflict with hotels. Um, for instance, street loading and open manufacturing uses can create very dangerous pedestrian experiences and present safety concerns. Hotels could also harm the efficiency of the surrounding businesses because hotel guests could complain about these activities. Also, as you can see from these photos or perhaps from your own experience, many of these hotels tend to be physically out of context as well. On the other hand, in the more mixed use M1 areas, hotels don't usually present the same direct land use conflicts um, because they, don't have, typically have, they typically have less industrial uses but hotel development can detract from opportunities for other uses and could result in neighborhood growth that is oriented more towards the tourists than the community itself. Um, furthermore, again, the design of the hotels is often out of context and doesn't really contribute to the pedestrian experience. So for these reasons, the Department of City Planning is proposing a zoning text amendment to establish a City Planning Commission special permit for new hotels, motels, and motels in M1 districts. 
The tourism industry is certainly essential to New York City's economy and has had positive impacts um, with new jobs and support for other industries such as restaurants and cultural institutions. And because the hotel and tourism industry is important, it would be impractical to have all new hotels citywide to go through a special permit process. Um, for M1 districts, however, this case-by-case, -case, site-specific review process would let everyone consider the appropriateness of new hotels. In the more actively industrial areas, this would identify where hotels and existing uses are potentially incompatible, and in the more mixed-use areas, evaluate if the city wants to direct growth towards other sectors and achieve balanced neighborhood growth. Moreover, a CPC special permit would still allow for hotels when it is deemed appropriate. So this map shows the areas that would be affected by the proposal. In orange are the areas where a new hotel development would be still permitted as of right, and in light blue, sorry, in orange are the areas where a new hotel development would have to go through a special permit process, and in light blue are the areas where hotels could still develop as of right. So here is a larger map of just Brooklyn. Um, the proposal would apply to all M1 districts, but it would exclude mixed-use districts. Um, it would also exclude airport property and areas adjacent to airports that are predominantly non-residential. Um, lastly, it would also exclude areas with existing hotel special permit provisions. In the areas affected by the proposal, new transient hotels will be permitted only by a CPC special permit. And in doing so, the commission must find the following. Um, that the proposed site plan for the project shows that it will minimize potential conflicts between the hotel and the adjacent uses. That the hotel will not cause undue traffic and congestion in the area. And lastly, that the proposed project will not impair the characteristic of the surrounding area. Furthermore, hotels existing on the date of adoption of the text will be considered conforming use. But enlargements of hotels use that um, wishes to increase the floor area by more than 20% will have to go through a special permit. There are also some vesting provisions in place. A hotel development that has a building permit or a partial permit issued by the Department of Buildings by the date of referral, which was April 23rd, um, will be vested. From the date of adoption, however, these projects will have three years to either complete a construction or receive certificate of occupancy. In addition, we will not require a special permit for hotels that are for a public purpose, such as temporary housing for the homeless. This means that rules, rules of citing homeless facilities will not change, and it will continue to be permitted as of right in M1 districts as it is today. So if this proposal is enacted, every new hotel in an M1 district would have to apply for a special permit. This includes the full land use review process with community board review, borough president review, uh, city planning commission, and usually the council also votes on it. Um, the total length of the process is typically almost two years. So as far as the timeline, we, as I mentioned before, we referred out this proposal last Monday, April 23rd, and um, we've begun the public review process. Um, all community boards, borough boards, borough presidents will have 60 days to review and comment on the proposal. If you guys have any questions, um, we have a project page um, that has a summary of the proposal itself, and please feel free to email us at m1hotels underscore dl. Thank you. So before we open it up, um, if you could go to the slide that showed the M1 sky exposure plane, uh, and also uh, in your presentation, while you show the areas that would no longer be as of right, mm -hmm. When you go to the community boards, it'd also be helpful to show a slide, uh, board explicit, district explicit, for both the where it would be as of right and where the special For each is. district, you mean? Yeah, we yeah. go to each board, but it's of important course. to show them where yeah. hotels would remain as of right. So mm -hmm. for those who don't know, the C2 districts that are within a 1,000 feet of a limited access highway, such as BQE, um, also, in only Brooklyn one case, we have a C25 dish district that's as of right as well. Um, but then the C4 districts, the C5s and C6 found downtown, and then C8 districts that are found in various parts. So that would where hotels would remain as of right. So just want to point out the M11 and the M12, and this image is more like an M12. The M11 and the M12 envelope 
The M11 is similar to a C81, so if a board has a C81 district, it's a similar image, and the C82 district would mirror this image. So when you do have city planning come out, just want you to understand the context. Um, so we'll move forward to some questions. Uh, and add, to add to that, our project page actually has maps for each community district, so you guys can click on the map and go into your own borough or own community district to see a more detailed map. Great. So as noted in your presentation, hotels operated for a public purpose by the city or under contract with the city would be exempt from the special permit requirement as a means to accommodate temporary housing assistance or shelter to homeless families and individuals. Mm -hmm. In such instances, what percentage of hotel rooms would be required to be designated for public purpose for such hotels to be constructed as of right? And what would happen to the certificate occupancy should such contract not be continued? Okay. So to answer your first question um, of how many percentage of the rooms have to be pur purpose-built, it, it would have to be 100% purpose-built facilities now. So you, if anything, there is increased transparency because you wouldn't have um, a commercial hotel um, renting out just a portion of their rooms for um, the public purpose. And to answer your second question, when when the certificate of occupancy expires or the contract ends, unless, um, unless the nonprofit organization or um, the operator renews the contract with DHS, if they want to revert it back to a community uh, or a commercial hotel, they would have to go through a special permit process. So the CFO would be then invalid once the occupancy is over with That's the That's correct. And then uh, one more question, uh, given the proximity to active industrial businesses with heavy truck traffic, sidewalk loading and storage and uh, hazardous pedestrian crossing issues and vehicular crossings, why in your special permit findings is that a concern for hotel visitors but not a basis of concern listed for occupants of hotels used as shelters? Um, that's a very good question. Um, we do acknowledge that it's not ideal to have homeless facilities in these areas as well. Um, but unfortunately, the city does have a very chronic shortage of facilities for the homeless population. And um, it is a way for us to be flexible with the legal mandate that the city has to um, house the homeless population. OK, thank you. At this time, I open up the floor for members of the borough board or representatives to ask. Any questions? Please um, use the microphone. Excuse me. Use the microphone, please. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Stephen Harrison from Community Board 10. Uh, I'm interested to know why this is being limited to uh, a special permit uh, only to manufacturing districts. Uh, I know that mm -hmm. in Community Board 10 we have an issue here with a C8 uh, mm -hmm. that uh, all the issues that you're talking about actually apply right there. Right. So why isn't this being extended a little bit further while we have that opportunity? The tourism industry is very essential for New York City. They've actually generated a lot of revenue over the past years, and um, this proposal here was looking more of the direct land use conflict, which is more prominent in M1 districts, um, and doing it a citywide or even restri restricting these in the commercial districts where they're as of right, right now um, wasn't practical, or we thought it would be um, detrimental to the tourism industry. Are you saying that it's basically an arbitrary cutoff point? No, I, in M1 districts, we found more land use conflicts and uh, that are related to zoning um, more than the commercial districts where it's already very mixed use in character. Um, that's why we're applying it to M1 districts, not the commercial districts. Have you studied the commercial districts too in detail? Um, not that I'm aware of, actually. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions, please? Yes, hello, I just need a clarification. No, please so, state your name and who you represent. Thank you. Hello, I'm Vladimir Edward, and I represent uh, City Council Member Matthew Jean of the 40th District. Mm -hmm. So I see here that you said the M1 districts are uh, districts that are pertaining to industrial locations. So does that pertain to, like, factories, closed factories around that area, basically? Is that what, uh, what you mean by industrial locations? In 
industrial areas with manufacturing uses. Yeah. yeah, I mean, M1 districts are very widely mapped throughout the city, and they do vary a lot in character, but in the more active, actively industrial areas, we find a lot of warehousing, factories, a lot of heavy loading, and mm -hmm. those are, they vary a lot in business characters too, but those are some of the um, businesses that we were referring to. Thank you. That's correct. Just to further clarify, if you happen to have a warehouse that's not in an industrial district, this text would not have any bearing. And it's not like you have to have an active industrial. There's many uses that happen to be industrial uses. They could, in industrial districts, so it's M districts. So if I have a retail store there and I want to place a hotel, because it's in an M district, it doesn't matter that I'm not an industrial use. It matters that I'm in an M district. That's what triggers the special permit. Right. Doesn't matter the use, the fact you're in a manufacturing district. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions from borough board members or representatives? Yes, please use the microphone, state who you are. And Hey, I'm David Estrada, representing uh, Council Member Menchaca in the 38th district, and I want to address my comment to the areas in and around Community Board 7 uh, and Sunset Park in particular. Um, your statements that you acknowledge that some hotel placement in manufacturing districts uh, might be problematic is, is really offensive to the community that the council member Menchaca represents. We have a high number of hotels that were built on spec over the course of the, the last 10 years, some within a block of each other, each and every one has at some point uh, either been partially or entirely occupied by homeless services. We have hotels that never opened, that never applied for a license, that never hung a sign, that never advertised a room, and are swept up by contractors. So I want to express a sentiment from the community that Councilman Menchaca represents that uh, this sounds full of holes, and our community is burdened as it stands. And I have, uh, uh, I want to follow up with your agency around uh, some of the some of the questions you had about um, public purpose, varieties of public pur purpose that may not be homeless shelter placement, uh, the continuation of public purpose, pur public purpose that occupies a portion of a hotel initially and then expands. Um, I, th I think we have a lot of a, a lot of discussion uh, needed around this topic, especially in District 38 and Community Board 7. So I'll flag right. that for you now. Okay, thank um, you. May I ask also that when you come to our communities and discuss this, uh, you don't use citywide aggregate numbers for things like the tourist industry or the demand for hotel rooms over a long period of time. We do need, and we'll look for it on your website if it's there already, uh, very specific numbers about the build out of hotel facilities in our specific geography. Um, and, and, which, uh, and, and also I would add to that please a request for the number of permits that are in process uh, that haven't broken ground. Because there's a pretty good window for people to mm -hmm. rush to market right. uh, with this in the uh, long period of time it takes to move through the special permit formation process. Pardon me if I don't use the technical language correctly. Um, I'd like to know um, why uh, specifically, and maybe you could answer this now, uh, mixed-use districts are excluded from consideration since mixed-use districts are uh, perhaps a creative way to uh, rezone certain sections of uh, District 38. Right. Um, to answer your mixed-use district question, um, just like similar to the commercial areas, um, mixed-use districts are already very mixed-use in character. They have a lot of retail, some uh, residential, and um, these MX districts were actually established to um, encourage investment for the city. Um, so we thought it best to limit our areas of applicability to M1 districts. Okay, um, so thank you for that. Um, can you just tell me about Botels? <laughs> I saw that term. Yeah, um, we had multiple discussions actually with the Department of Buildings regarding Botels too. Um, they're defined in the zoning resolution as um, a building that is accessible by boat um, or um, a hotel by the dock, basically. Um, a hotel on a dock? On the dock, yeah, uh, or on the boat. Or on um, a boat, it's right. at a dock. Uh, it is a very antiquated um, definition um, in the zoning resolution, but as far as we, we're aware right now, um, we do not have any hotels in New York City. So 
uh, for a waterfront district that spans from uh, you know, Atlantic Basin and the Red Hook Container Terminal in the north to Brooklyn Army Terminal and 64th Street in the south, I think it would be important to have some specificity around that and, right. and not to just sort of flag it as a novelty and walk away. Mm -hmm. um, that opens the potential for uses that might be quite contrary to um, that. And I, I have some learning to do around whether zoning extends onto water. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe, I'll, maybe we'll have a cup of coffee sometime on that. I think that's a very really good point. Thank uh -huh. you. Um, there was a little discussion around certificate of occupancy as it originally is offered to a public use, a public benefit. Public location, purpose. A public mm -hmm. purpose. And, then, and that then if the public purpose concludes, the certificate of occupancy would need to be reformed for the new use on the site. Is that, am I roughly in layman's terms, if I have that right, that a, a, a hotel structure opens Mm -hmm. It's never a hotel. It's just mm -hmm. immediately occupied for homeless services. Right. Uh, that contract comes to an end at some beautiful date in the future when we don't need and we don't have that many homeless people in that. Thank you, I hope. Uh, what, what happens to that structure then? What's the disposition of public use, public benefit, um, public purpose structures when the public benefit ends? So you're asking if when the public purpose use is no longer in place, um, what's going to and happen I have to the building? Own, I have an owner on 24th Street with a 24 key hotel that's never done retail business. Mm -hmm. It's only ever been 100% occupied for homeless services. Mm -hmm. It's not a shelter. Mm -hmm. it's, temp it's characterized as temporary by DHS. Mm -hmm. So then whoever's carrying that contract, Samaritan or Brooklyn Children's Services or Acacia walks away. And now I have a standing hotel structure mm -hmm. on a M1 zoned residential with residential non-conforming on 24th Street and 4th Avenue in Sunset Park, what happens to that building and what can the owner do with it? If it, if it wishes to be a commercial hotel, then it would actually have to go through a special permit process. Um, as far as potential other uses, I can't, I can't say for sure what that building could be used for, but as far as this proposal stands, if they wish to be used as a commercial hotel, they would have to go through a special permit process. Okay, good to know. And then you mentioned some exclusions to areas where special permits would be required. I think it was on slide 14, do I want to say? I hope I got that number right. Was it? Maybe, maybe one, 15, let's try 15. Oh, the list of excluded areas? Yeah, help me help I me think I just mentioned it by anecdote, actually. Oh, you just mentioned actually. it? Yeah. Okay. So do, you, do you want me to reiterate? I, I could reiterate it. No, no, that, I don't waste take the group's time on that. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from borough board members or representatives? At this time, if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question or make a comment, please stand up, come forward. Come. Give her the mic. You can ask a question. Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd. And I do have a question to ask. Um, I'm seeing this presentation, and of course, we barely ever get presentations at CB9. And now I'm questioning, will this presentation um, be offered to the community? Will it come to CB9? And will the meetings actually happen in CB9? Because right now, these committee meetings are now happening at Borough Hall. And I'm just a little concerned about why is it that community board meetings are now happening in Borough Hall outside of our district so that our representatives and our residents cannot attend. So now my question to you is, first, why is land use committee meetings now happening at Borough Hall that then prevents the residents from attending? And will this also be the same thing with this presentation? Will we have an opportunity as a community to view this um, this uh, presentation where we have an opportunity to speak because we are not allowed to speak at our community board meetings. We're not allowed to speak at our committee meetings. So will we be able to ask questions at our committee meeting when this particular presentation happens? Thank you. Could you please answer um, whether or not this presentation will be presented to community boards in general and if board nine will have the opportunity to make this presentation as well? Right, we actually are offering the presentation to all the community boards. Um, we have a borough, we have the Brooklyn Borough Department of City Planning actually working with each community district borough planners to schedule the presentation and put it on the agenda. Thank you. Um, that's 
that, I, I, oh, it'll be here at the Borough Hall. And when will the community, will the community be advised? Because we're never told when this meeting happens. Our community board does not disseminate any information to the community residents. So how is it that the community residents meet in one You don't have to answer that question. Okay, we'll so speak thank with you. our Thank you for answering district. the question yeah. to the best of your ability. In regards to board nine, board nine would have to request the presentation to be right. there, number one. Number two, land use meetings for board nine or other community boards are not held at Brooklyn Borough Hall. This, excuse me. There is one scheduled for next week on TV nine's website. If there's one for next week, then that's a special request that they put in, which other boards are allowed to do that. But as a rule, meetings are not held here for community boards unless there is a special request, which is allowable. So do we have any other questions pertinent yeah, to, do we have any other questions from anyone else that's pertinent to this presentation? Yes. No, could you please take the microphone and state your name? Um, hi, my name is uh, Janine Nichols and I'm a resident of uh, Crown Heights. I, I was interested in what you said um, from Sunset Park about what might happen to these buildings that go up to address the need for homeless services and shelter um, at some time when this need might disappear, even though it seems only to grow. So why, why is it that we, we, we can put up buildings for temporary shelter and temporary services and we, we never build anything that actually provides places for people to live who are without homes. So what, you know, what, I would think that the use for that building would be to convert it to housing for people as opposed to just you know, keep, shuffling, keep shuffling people who have been displaced into um, you know, large new buildings that you know, are maybe gonna serve it, you know, turn to a tourist use or something. I mean, it just seems cold hearted. To, if I could respond to that, um, as I mentioned before, it's not an ideal situation and we acknowledge that. Um, but this proposal here is actually looking at land use conflicts that are generated from commercial hotels and exemption for the public purposely built homeless facilities um, are not actually under, we don't, we, Department of City Planning doesn't have the regulations to really, an, or the ex expertise to answer that question, but it is a, yeah, um, it is a city's legal obligation to house these populations, and unfortunately, we do have a shortage, so that's been the case for DHS's siting op options. Okay, did anyone else who hasn't spoken have a question that they would like to ask pertinent to this particular topic? So that concludes our business related to the special permit for hotels and manufacturing zones, zoning text amendment. I would urge community board representatives to coordinate such presentations for their community board. At this time, I'd like to ask, does any member of the borough board or the representative have any un unfinished business? Any new business? Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, June 5th, 2018 at 6 p.m. Before I call the motion, I wanna just take a moment to thank each of you who came and who came on time specifically. And a special thanks to number 18, CB1, you know, so that we could have quorum. May I please have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? You know what you have to do. Teresa Scavos, 5015, motion to adjourn. May I please have a second? Yeah, okay, you didn't use a mic, but I'll take it. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for coming. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? So thank you and have a great night. Thank you.